why are we here? All right. So uh, the reason why we are here is because we care. So we care about the things that is happening around us, especially during this COVID. We care about what's happening to our livelihood. And we care about the food that we eat, especially, and whether ultimately will the food affect us today. And I'm sure everyone that has joined us today here today, you are from all walks of life, you know, whether you are researchers to uh, just uh, everyday man who eats food and wants to know where the food comes from. You know, today itself is really some, uh, we hope that the webinar will be really insightful uh, and the local farm exchange is exactly what we hope to achieve. And as we go along, we will be using Slido. So this is uh, to get everybody you know, to participate in a much uh, experiential way. So we would like everyone to help us uh, go into slido.com right now. All right, or there's a QR code on screen where you can actually uh, QR code. All right, at the same time, uh, TLFX2021. Okay, and what we would like everyone to do, uh, just to warm up everybody. All right, so this is what we hope to achieve. All right, scan the QR code. Join us at slido.com and the code is TLFX2021 and just add a word or two. What do you think is the future of fish? All right, so just going to the Slido. Well, the first one here came in bleak. Oh, that's, that's yeah, sustainable. All right, let's see how, all right, just keep sharing your thoughts. You know, it's going to be your show. Yeah, this is really about you. It's not just about us. All right, it takes a whole ecosystem to come in. All right, so just share what, what's your thought process, all right, the future of fish. That's why I think every one of us are here today, you know, to really get this thing going. And for those who just join us, welcome on board. All right, we are just going, before we kickstart the whole webinar, we just want everybody to understand that we'll be using Slido. Uh, later on itself, there will be certain polls as we go along. At the same time itself, there'll be Q&A uh, during the panel discussion where we will invite every one of you to share your thoughts so that we can actually have a very good webinar today itself. I, I guarantee you, it'll be a very different webinar, all right, uh, so that you can really, you know, really have deep thoughts about what this is all about and, you know, as simple as just fish. All right, just let me go through the slides and you can see that, wow, all the words are coming in, you know, localized, dying trade, promising, some say there's lots of opportunities. Uh, you know, it's, uh, Blick seems to be, a very big thing among a lot of us, uh, but it's exciting as well. Yes, I'm sure it's very excitable. High cost, farm base. Uh, let's see what else that's coming in. Some may extinct. Yeah, I think so too. COVID has really disrupted many of our businesses and it's going to be really tough. And see what else. Microplastics. Yes, you name them. Yeah, I mean, in terms of sustainability itself, I think that's going to be a huge word, all right? Uh, do these two exist, sustainability and, and farming? I'm sure there is, but how do we get about doing that? I'm sure later on, all our extinguished guests and speakers that are here today will be able to share more as well. Looks like uh, a couple of things here that is coming up. Uh, you can see that uh, safe sea lives, yes. Uh, ocean is ours, we are there to keep it as well. Uh, getting new generation, I noticed that as well. It's very important as well, getting the young ones to be part of this ecosystem, all right, so that we can continue to do that as well. And future protein source, possible, I'm sure. 30 by 30, that's, that's why we are here. Yes. Wow, all the other parts are coming through. Let's see what else uh, may excite everyone here. So is it exciting for the fish industry? Or is it just going to be bleak? as we look at this whole uh, poll that has been, you know, been seen here. But I think the key word that really stands out among everyone here, as you can see, is that we want it to be sustainable. And sustainability itself is really not just about one side, which is just about sustainable farming. It is also about a sustainable ecosystem that we all wanted to be in as well. So, so thank you, everyone. I think it's good. It's just to kick everybody into the action for today. In the next uh, two hours, we will try our best to ensure that you have a, a great learning experience with us. Uh, we are learning just as much with you as much as you are learning from us as well. So thank you for your first slide. For those who just joined, welcome on board. Welcome to the Local Farm Exchange 2021. It's our first time doing this, and I'm going to share more with you as we go along.
All right, let's 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 proceed. Thank you for all your poll. You guys have been great. Thank you. You know, in this whole COVID situation itself, one of the key things that everyone have noticed is really about climate change, right? Articles after articles in Singapore, you realize that, you know, it's gaining so much of attention that like, you know, we are just driving uh, this morning itself at 8 a.m. How many of you feel that it's really getting so warm? It's at 32. All right, it's just amazing how the temperature has changed and climate change definitely has an impact in many ways that, you know, it, it reduces a lot of things, increases a lot of stuff as well. And even Singapore, as you notice, have actually gone into a green plan as well, making sure that we have our sustainable plan uh, in 2030, just as much as our food security plan. And in terms of our food security, is it at risk? Frankly, it is. You know, as a fourth generation farmer myself, I'm in the horticulture farm and I can sense a lot with the farmers around during COVID situation that the threat is real. It's really real. All right. It's not just for fun. Uh, when the MCO was uh, implemented with Malaysia, you know, we are worried about so many things, right? Our eggs, our vegetables. And then when logistics are being disrupted during COVID situation, even you have money, you realize that you can't buy food. So the threat is getting very, very up to your face and everybody is worried about it because it's not just Singapore's problem, it's a global problem. The whole world itself is worried about food and will this disrupt the way food is being produced? Will this disrupt the way food is being exported or imported? The answer is yes. But how can one country like Singapore, which is just one small red dot, literally maneuver its food security strategy? So what are the things that we have to look at? And of course, in our 3030, I think in the poll earlier, everybody is talking about 3030. SFA have actually set this 3030. By 2030 itself, we will have attained 30% of our nutritional needs. I think this is something that many of us are wondering, what does it mean? Does it mean we have to increase more? Uh, do we have to uh, produce more? Is that what we're trying to do? Or is it that we have to get more of our different technology in so that we can have different varieties of food? Uh, what's at stake? I think this is something that, you know, everyone on the street will be asking, or maybe they don't, because next door is 7-Eleven, supermarket, Red Mart, you know, Grab, food is simple. Do we really care? So I guess this is something that we really have to ask ourselves, you know, where the risk is there, all right, and are we going to do something different? Just for some background, I know that, uh, you know, we are really delighted to have a lot of different uh, attendees today. Uh, some of you are from overseas as well. Uh, for those who have known about this, uh, well, let's just let me keep this to a very short. This is just to share with everybody the backdrop of Singapore. All right? We are a small little island and we have about 220 farms. I'm not kidding you. Many of you would think that oh, Singapore should have about 10. Should Singapore have 15 or 30, but we have 200 over farms. But the farms include many types, right? From fish to your eggs to your vegetables. Uh, even in the classification of farms, you have horticulture farms in Singapore as well. So there's various. But today itself, the topic that we are focusing on is on fish. So to extract the fish, you'll notice that we have 109 farms that is in the sea base. This is based on 2019. Uh, statistics from SFA, and there's 12 that's indoor farm. So that's the number. It, but in all totality of farms that is in Singapore itself, it occupies less than 1% of our land. And that's the situation that we're in. This is going to be interesting. Uh, I was just trying to prepare the slides, you know, wanted to get something to kickstart everybody to talk about this, right? And I was just looking through the annual report of SFA. Uh, as we all know, we import 90% of our food, all right? Our fresh produce mainly comes from overseas. And I was just looking at the stats. It kind of surprised me. 2019, if you look on the left, all right, the local production, we produce 14% of our vegetables, 10% of our fish, 26% of our eggs demand. But came COVID last year, everything was disrupted. I would assume that the production will have ramped up because there is a shortage and everybody will want to buy local. But then the statistic shows otherwise. The vegetables dropped by 1% to 13% of the vegetables itself. Fish dropped from 10 to 8% and the eggs increased by 2%. Why is that so? You know, as we are into this COVID situation itself, 
am I just stating these facts without understanding what is actually behind the numbers? Could it be because due to uncertainty that the farmers are not producing more? Or is it because of the import that comes through, whether it's the feed that we have, etc., that disrupted the farmers from producing more? Or what could be the other reasons? So you can see that the whole ecosystem of local farm produce is not so straightforward. Because will tax save this situation last year? Will the farmers continue to drive more in terms of production? Well, that's why we are here today. All right, so as we go along, the local farm exchange by Garden Asia, when we wanted to start this platform, you know, what we really hope is to simply put no farmers, no food. I mean, I have the privilege to serve the farming community for more than 15 years, all right, in the crunchy area. I get to know so many farmers and organize a conference in 2016 in the Commonwealth. And I really learned that farmers itself ultimately are just any other entrepreneur. They are businessmen, all right? And if the farmers have no incentive to grow food, there will be no there will be no food on the table. So the local farm exchange basically was inspired to literally create a platform for thought leaders and change makers like yourself today to come together, you know, debate on this topic, come up with various perspectives and important issues that we can impact local farming. And I'm really pleased that every one of you have made this first inaugural local farm exchange 2021, the future of which is there one a success. Our speakers uh, have all various depth of knowledge and they will be giving interesting perspective into aquaculture, all right, starting with the present and maybe sharing with us what do you think lies ahead in the future as well. So keep the questions coming at the end of the, during the panel discussion, which we will discuss more and hope that we can share and answer all your doubts and questions as well. And let's kick start today. Kenny, you're muted. All right, sorry about that. But the little tech, as I was just sharing with everybody, this is our first TLFX and... I'm sorry? All right, okay, sorry. So we will just wait for the slides to come back on again. And for those who just joined in, welcome once again to TLFX 2021. I'm Kenny, I'm going to be a host and moderator for today. And we are going to kickstart the, the whole experience for the local farm at Babinia. And of course, let me just going to introduce to you our, our first speaker. All right, I think he is someone that most of you may have known, and he's no other than Dr. Lee. All right, Dr. Lee, Center Director of Aquaculture Innovation Center. Dr. Lee itself has more than 25 years of dynamic hands-on experience and networking in providing technological innovation and solutions to enterprise across the globe. He received his Bachelor of Science and Master of Science from McGill University, Canada, and PhD from the University of Alberta, Canada. He was a recipient of the Alberta Heritage Foundation Scholarship for Medical Research. Dr. Lee has carried out his postdoctorate fellowship at Yale University School of Medicine, USA, before pursuing his academic career at School of Medicine, NUS where he's currently an adjunct associate professor. He's an honorary of Singapore Spirit of Enterprise and a graduate of GMP Harvard Business School. He also served as a scientific advisor, consultant to many life sciences companies and organization. Dr. Lee is also the immediate past director of Tomasic Polytechnic School of Applied Science, where he spearheaded technology capabilities and provided valuable innovative solutions to more than 150 companies. So today, Dr. Lee will be sharing with all his vision of the future of aquaculture for Singapore. Dr. Lee, please. Hi, thanks, Kenny. <laughs> thanks for the nice introductions. So let me share my slides. Do you see my slide, Kenny? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Lee. All right. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming for this uh, wonderful webinar. And of course, thanks to uh, Kenny for organizing it. 
we at AIC, we constantly been asked the question like, you know, why, why Singapore is doing this, you know, referring to aquaculture? Uh, and are we able to do it or not? And maybe I would like to take today's opportunity just to um, share with all of you my personal opinion, okay, how I see this story fall and whether are we able to make it or not. So the, the start off with the story. You see, we, we like to talk about story. And, and if you look at it, we have uh, two stories before the full story. So the first story is energy story. This is actually quite way back. And most of you, uh, if you are very young, you most likely couldn't remember that. And the one that we all remember very well and we did very well is actually water story. And the next one that we are talking about very, very actively for the past few years is talk about food story. And then, of course, food story is talk about food security and how can Singapore can have our own food resilient, right? And the strategy wise, actually three baskets, as you can see. So the first basket is diversifying the import sources. So this one, SFA is doing wonderfully well and also together with the private sectors. And then the second basket is actually look at the growth local, right? How to grow local because it's very important. Like what can you say? The COVID disruption is actually one of the many coming events that would do that to us. So if there's any disruption in logistics, that's it, we are going to have problem with our food supply. And uh, looking forward in the future, some analysts actually predict the world war may trigger by the food and not other things else. And the third uh, bucket that uh, SFA is looking at is actually growth overseas because we know we have limitation land uh, in Singapore. So eventually we like our farms to actually uh, grow our produce outside Singapore in the country that is friendly to us so that we can secure our supply back to Singapore. Yeah. So these are the basically strategy. Now, why don't we don't use the word food strategy We put food story? And the reason for that is the story is actually means everybody should be involved. Yeah. If a strategy is maybe only the policymaker or certain group of the people that is doing that. But when we use the word story, that is we all involved, all hands on deck is part of our story and we should see how can we contribute. Now this one um, is a snapshot. Uh, can you already give the tables? So uh, maybe some deviations because the number is in the flux all the time. Okay. So in general, like what can you say? Uh, the land that used for agri and aqua uh, uh, farming is actually less than 1%. Now from that angle, I um, actually want to put a pet on our farmers. That is with less than 1% of the land surface, we try to produce 30% of our nutrition needs. So to a lot of people, they say it's a stress target, it's very difficult, but to me is we should give our farmers the due appreciation and recognition because with such a little piece of land we allocate for farming and we expect them to produce 30% of our nutrition needs. So that is, imagine how critical is our farmer now that they're actually hindering this very huge responsibility for the security of our people in this small little island. And you can see the location of the farms is actually at the northern part of Singapore, right? And then for the fish, the blue I can see is either on the eastern part or the uh, western part of the Jaw Street. Of course, now the Singapore is going to the southern part of uh, Singapore, going into the so-called deep sea cage farming. Now for the uh, Farming, usually, of course, you know, the land base basically are mud pond is very traditional and this will be phasing up very soon. Now, the next one that we have abundant of it, about 120, 110 is about the coastal fish farming using cage. Yeah. And but Singapore, we are going to into open sea farming uh, that using a lot of technology. So that is the ultimate aim that uh, the country is going for. And on your left, you can see these are the, some common species that has been grown in Singapore water. Yeah. Now, when we look at the challenges that we face for Singapore aquaculture, now we all know the first three items, we just don't have enough land and sea space. Yeah, that, that is the fact. And also the manpower because of competing with other industry and, and, and uh, our, our youngster nowadays, even though they like to go to farming because they find that, you know, uh, especially the Gen Z, but the problem is the parents say, don't be a farmer. So <laughs> there's another group that we are facing that the older generation, they do not understand the farming in today's age is very different at their time. And of course, we do have the environmental conditions here. Yeah? For example, the, what can you say about uh, the global warming, you know, and, 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 and all the other things that is facing. Now, with that, what the farms need to do. Now, if you look at it, 
we have this constraint and it's real and, and we cannot expand our land space or sea surface too much. We can't actually. So what we really need to is for the local farms to be more innovative. OK, and they have to write on the technologies to overcome all these challenges. And of course, uh, to make sure that they are able to uh, make a decent living, they have to increase the productivity. Right? And of course, now we talk about sustainability. We can't just go and destroy the environment just for the monetary gains. So these are all the other constraints. And then we are imposing the farmers to achieve high productivity, adopting technologies that to some farmers, they're just really not familiar with. So you can see these are the challenges uh, uh, the farming industry is facing. And most of all is we don't give them much time to react because it's really, we do, the runway is really short for Singapore. Now, when we look into this whole perspective, uh, when we two years ago, uh, when we founded AIC, of course, the preparations way back. And we also look into what would be our advantages if we want to embark on these protein productions in Singapore, right? So when we look at it, we look left, we look right, we look everywhere. What is our advantage? We just don't have enough manpower to compete with any countries in the world. We don't have enough land. We don't have enough water. We don't have enough anything. So because of that, could that be our advantage? And that's what we start to look at it. Can we look at the size as our advantage? Instead of crying over what we don't have, we turn it around, say, okay, maybe small size is our advantage, right? Petite is beautiful. So that's how the whole evolving of the adoption of technologies, developing of the technologies for our urban farming is towards that small is our advantage. And because it's small, whatever we do, we make ourselves ahead of the curve. So that's how we look into the the, the driven part is based on necessity, yeah? Because if we learn from business school, they always say, look, you must rely on your strengths. That's how you fight the battles. But in these cases, we are looking at the necessity we, because we don't have any strength yet. So all we have is we need certain things. So the necessity driven is our model to drive this industry. Now, because of that, what we're going to develop will be using less water, less land, less energy, less manpower. Okay, hopefully when you put them all together, less cost, but high productivity. So if that can be achieved, we are truly ahead of the curve. And that's what the industry wants in any industry for that matter. And of course, we look at also into other countries, Singapore, we don't have this issue because it's a city state. But you look at other countries, you talk about meat production tend to be produced far, far away from the consumer, right? As a result, they always face the same problem. I don't have enough so-called uh, workers because workers like to go into the city to get a better pay and plus the urbanization plus the improve in education so the kids if they're well educated they tend to go to the city to work right because they hope to get more salary now isn't that the farm will have the facing same problem as what we're facing in singapore that's lacking labor that is so even you look at india despite 1.3 billion populations the farmer they don't have workers Okay, at the farm, the every age of the farmers is more than 50 years old. So they don't have young people to work in the farm. So they are going to face what Singapore is facing, short of labor. Now, shortage of water is real. So despite whatever river they have, or mountain they have, or glacier that they have, the water shortage is real as well. So portable water. So which means they are going to face what Singapore is facing. Now, if you're going to move your production closer to the city, because where your consumers are, your land cost is going to go up. So which means whatever we are facing today, other countries will be faced eventually. So that is the reason why whatever we develop today, we can export to other countries like what we did with Water Story. That is, we don't need to sell water, but we sell water technology. And this is the whole focus we're talking about here, that can Singapore be an aquaculture innovation hub, where at the end of the day, we are not expecting just exporting just the food, but we're exporting the talents, we're exporting the technologies and the know-how. So that is even higher value type of the business that we are talking about. So of course, Singapore has other advantages like connectivity. Yeah, so that's very, very important. Dr. Fasha will share with you that this is very really critical. Despite expensive things that we're facing, have to pay, the connectivity gives us an advantage over other countries because we can reach to the customer in the shortest possible time and retain the freshness of the produce that we have. So the last part will be the consumer. Where are they? They are all in Asia. We are really at the center of the activities. So most of the cons consumers that consume the seafood, okay, actually in Asia. So we are right there in the middle of the actions. 
So, of course, we go into mesh economy and whatnot. So this is how the position of Singapore is doing, starting from because we are small. And this small, that gives us the advantage. So we already experienced this is going on in Singapore right now. Okay, you have seen uh, um, the, the BCA, SLA, right? Everybody's coming forward, all hands on tax, uh, giving up space. Okay, a lot of the space that's on top of the car park, rooftops, you know, even under MRT tracks, any space that if you have a good idea, most probably can get the space for your farming. So we are actually utilize whatever space that we have. And this is we call phase one. That's easy because existing space underutilized can we use it with minimum uh, cost and modification. So this is going on very, very strongly. Now, the next thing is, of course, uh, you all heard about the Agri Food Innovation Park. So this is the master plan that uh, uh, Singapore is doing so at the northern part of the Singapore. So basically on the Lim Chukang where the farms are, all the way to the western part, uh, eastern part where the food, uh, Sinoco food, uh, 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 the, the zone is. So the whole area is designed and will be story, uh, a factory-like kind of meeting, right? So it's really important establishment that is working very closely with the JTC to build this thing up. So it's coming. Uh, but of course, uh, the COVID uh, dis delayed the, 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 our completion dates. But is there? So that is the plan for the future uh, for our agri productions. Now, what we really want to look at in the future is actually an integrated approach. Okay, it cannot be piecemeal, cannot be you do your fish your, your way, I do my vegetable my way, you know, and you do your micro algae, we do my feed separately. Can we all integrate together, make it more efficient? So it's ultimately that okay, if put together, then we will be even able to utilize the space more uh, efficiently. So now, I just want to share really uh, two slides. So the aquaculture industry actually is more than just growing fish, okay? So it's not just a farming. If you look at the other opportunity that in this industry itself, and if we just break it up to four major components, that is first is husbandry, talk about the hardware and whatnot, okay? And the nutrition that is fit, you need to feed the animals and also the health, okay? That's obvious because they are all living thing. And the last part was on the building. Now you look at it, these are the four major components and you have sub-components and each of the sub-components is an industry by itself. And they are all billion dollars market cap. So it's very, very powerful. So you don't really need to grow fish, but you can produce feed. You don't really need to produce feed, you can produce feed additive or feed ingredients. So in other words, based on what you have, you can contribute. That's why we say this industry is one of the very rare kind that is so inclusive. Almost everybody can play a part in this industry. And that's the reason why we are excited. For those who are in this industry, we are excited. Despite the challenges we are facing, but we find that it's worth doing it. Okay, now, if you look at the, the, the post harvest, okay, just to look at the post harvest, what we have, after once you have the fish, of course, we talk about processing. Now, we bring in the food manufacturing sectors into the pictures. Now, we talk about wholesales. That is exactly our strength. That is the logistic hub, our connectivity, yeah? So, we can deliver anything to anywhere, or we can even sell for others. The next thing is regulatory, which is very good because this is a branding that we're talking about, Singapore branding. So because of that, there is a big market for testing certification and standard. And that's why Singapore, we're setting our own standards for good agriculture practice. That's why we want to export, not just, you know, the, the, the good way of growing thing, but once you grow your animals under our standards, okay, deliver the quality, we can buy back and then we can use our so-called logistic hub to ship up to the world. And the last part that is to the scientists is actually even more exciting than growing the fish. That is other things that the fish or any marine animal can contribute that is nutraceutical, cosmeceutical, and pharmaceutical. So in other words, we are looking beyond food now. Okay, All those things, the animal we grow can eventually be used for active ingredient in all this space. So that will be even higher value products we are talking about. So you can see that from pre harvest to post harvest we cut across so many industries and almost anybody I can talk to, yes, they can all play a part you know, in this exciting industry. So because it's so important, that's why we have to bring everybody on board. And that is the key because we don't have time to go slow in piecemeal again. So we try to bring everybody in Singapore where the talents are. So which means IHL, all the university and poly. 
talents. We get them all in together. Can we all work together as one team and help the industry as quick as possible? Because this is a very rare opportunity for Singapore to create an innovation hub for aquaculture. So with that, AIC was founded in 2019, uh, July. So we basically brought in everybody, okay, almost everybody uh, in science space where they can contribute in aquaculture. So you can say all university polis are involved. And of course, uh, AIC is supported by the Enterprise Singapore and also SFA. Now, with that, our vision here for AIC is actually uh, close the loop. Close the loop is our jagged in the industry that is complete the cycle or whatever you want to do, right? So that you can move slow, smoothly. And the the of course we don't talk about extensive farming. It has to be very super high intensive farming system. And this one, Dr. Fasho can share with you how he used technology to improve his productivity with the minimum space that he has. All right. Now. For us in AIC, we have four-pronged approach. Always, like anything else we do, we always do research. We always do innovation that is serving the industry. We always do the training and education. And also, we also want to have uh, a commercial space that is supporting the startup because we see a lot of youngsters coming in with great idea. But unfortunately, for aquaculture industry, you need space. You need water. You need tank, right? And you need animals. So that become a challenge. And as a result, we have the so-called launch pad to support them. But if you look at the research, we have the facility. We work very closely with the, let's say, NU, NTU, SIT, and also even with the uh, industry uh, leaders like SAS and AWS. Uh, the services, we have all kinds of service facility within our cell and also the training that we have, okay? Now, the technology cluster we are focusing on because we are servicing industry. We cannot be biased on one or two, okay? So it depends on where the, the company comes from. And what we do, we scope it into four cluster, and then we can focus on the talents in each cluster and support them uh, hopefully effectively. So we have genetic breeding, seed production as one cluster. Then we have health disease, husbandry management as one cluster. And then of course, nutrition, feed additive, you know, and feeding management. Now, behind that is all the smart technology we're talking about. We talk about industry 4.0. So these are the things that will help us move the development of this particular industry even faster, even more efficiently. So this is how we divide the technology cluster and put our talents under each group effectively. So what we have, just to share with you, that uh, at TP, uh, we do have a beautiful building here, okay, uh, just where our research facility uh, is set up here. This is where the whole thing began, okay? And then, of course, we are in the midst of the uh, renovating our uh, disease challenge facility because we have to move ahead of the curve. Disease is real, right? We experience with the COVID, so this is real, and we have to be ahead of the curve and make sure that we can stop it or prevent it from happening and protect our industry. Now, of course, we need space, and we are fortunately able to lease a, a, a private a farm out there at the Lim Chukang area, Sungai Bolo, so where we can do our uh, research and also uh, provide space for the industry, for those who need space and tank, and they can use our space for their business and work. And of course, uh, we set up the lab investigation lab. That's very important for disease at NTU. And the reason we play at NTU is because NTU is very kind, allow us to access to the other facility. Because when we do investigation, you need a lot of high-end instruments and equipment and also the talent, right? So by closer to university, that, that allows us to be able to do more, okay, and with a faster uh, speed in that sense. So it's all planned according to what we can do for the industry. Now, of course, I uh, just want to share with you in terms, because the time is constrained, uh, can you want me to tell you what are we doing in, in AIC? Because we do do some research. Some research we do is because it's too expensive, too difficult for the industry to embark on. So we have to get it started first and create a, a seed, allow it to grow later on. So one example is we are closing the loop with the mic crab, right? Because crabs, we just love crab. Uh, so, but there isn't enough crab in the market actually. So you want to have a big size of crab, one kg is very difficult unless you're a VIP. Otherwise, jum Jumbo will not give you the crabs. So the size of the crab getting smaller, right? And also skinnier in a way. So why? Because what caught is not sustainable. We have to culture and farm it. But to culture, to farm, you need babies. So if you don't have babies, nothing to talk about. So producing babies is a challenge. It's always a very difficult exercise in this in particular industries, in hatchery. So this is what we do, uh, create baby uh, crabs, okay? So support industry. And another one we do, we are looking at the so-called disease and we talk about oral 
vaccine. Okay, our lead scientist in AIC actually uh, developing this, and of course, the whole purpose is so that you can vaccinate your fish without actually inject them. You can feed them, so that make the administration of the vaccine much more effective. Okay, so in real time, I will stop here and thank you for your attention. Kenny, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Thank you for your detailed sharing with uh, what you are doing, all the amazing work at AIC. I think I, I can literally see a couple of things that uh, Dr. Lee have actually shared. Uh, one itself is really a robust ecosystem that is very critical. And we really need to have a good ecosystem to ensure that food in general, we can literally do as well as everyone else. The second thing itself that really resonates a lot with me is attracting the young. Uh, as a fourth generation farmer, I think this is something that I can really uh, resonate with. Uh, it's not easy. There's a lot of farmers that are willing to come in, young farmers. And I remember I was organizing the conference way back in 2016 with the Commonwealth. I asked a young African farmer, what is the biggest problem you have in Africa? And I was really surprised by his answer. Many of us will assume oh, it must be diseases, it must be water, it must be demand, it must be logistics, it must be everything. And the young farmer came to me and says, attracting young people to join me. I was shocked. I was dumbfounded. Means that regardless of where you are, whether you are in Africa, or whether you're in Singapore, or whether you're in other parts of the world, we need talent. And that is one part that made me realize that, you know, this is an industry that needs to be re-looked at and to look at it from a very different perspective as well. I think Dr. Lee have also shared with you and all of us here, we have learned that there's so much about research. I, I, what stuck to me earlier was the crab. You know, and every time now crab become more expensive, we want to make sure that the crab is really in place, you know, and you know, who do not want to sell a uh, crab, you know, at a better margin so that we have good nutritional food and yet we know that it's locally produced and we know that we can do something in research to make it better, safer, you name them, all right? That's what research is all about, to make it safer for everyone, make it bigger, etc. But, you know, it reminds me of this morning when I was, you know, uh, I left my, my wallet in the office yesterday and this is the first time I, I have, I'm alone with my phone. So I do not know whether what was going to happen. So I went for breakfast, thankfully, all right, uh, Cleany itself accept uh, a basically cashless payment. So I'm cleared. I had my breakfast nicely. Then I, I went on to uh, Tomasic Poly itself. I didn't bring my IC. And then thankfully for technology, you know, all of us literally have our own digital IC. I'm cleared as well. I can enter the, the campus without an issue as well. Then came lunch. Then realized that, oh, I didn't have cash and they don't accept tech. Then what's going to happen to me? So in, in terms of this itself, it's always the same, right? Whether whichever industry that we're in, the ecosystem must be robust. Everybody is doing the right thing, but the market must be ready. So to me itself is that if we are not buying local, if the crap that Dr. Lee can work with all the local farmers and, and make really nice crap for everybody, but we are not buying the crap, we're still buying imported crabs and making sure that they are cheaper, etc., then what incentive do farmers have? Are farmers slated as farmers that their job is to farm? We are no different from entrepreneur. We are no different from Bill Gates or Steve Jobs. We are all profit motivated individuals. So food for thought, right? So thank you, Dr. Lee, for your time, all right? And I think we just take a short little break with Slido, all right? Uh, the next one that you can see, Slido, everyone just go back to Slido. I know we are all have so much of things to share. Now, this is going to be something that you can do. Go back to Slido. For those who just joined us, we are using Slido so that you can all come together with me to, to enjoy the experience. Uh, let's see. Do you buy local farm fish? Well, 50% say yes, 50% say no. Keep it coming, keep it coming. All right. Uh, we are very curious whether, you know, as much as just like the crab that Dr. Lee have shared, I would love to buy local crab, but will you buy it? You know, supporting local to continue to produce is one thing. Buying is just as important. So let's let's put in our thought process, you know, just be upfront whether do you, have you buy, have you buy local fish? Do you go to supermarket and buy local fish? Or you go to the wet market and say, is, is this from Singapore? Do I buy the fish from, from local as well? Or you're lost, you don't even know what's the difference. 
All right, so that's very important, right? And many of us will just go in and say, you know, just look at how, how good the fish is, but is it something that we're looking at? 60% say yes, 40% say no. Well, this is uh, interesting data. All right, for those who are in here, welcome once again. And I'm Kenny. And for those uh, who have not uh, seen to Slido, Slido is basically a tool that we'll be using for this webinar so that we can get ourselves engaged. And many of you have already started uh, putting in the poll and some questions there, you know, so I thought this is really fun. So this is what I wanted to do before I introduce the second speaker. All right. So, all right. So the post is starting coming to an end. All right. And you can see that 61% all right, of the participants here have uh, submitted their poll and say, yes, we buy local fish. And 39% say, no, uh, you know, we didn't. Well, the next speaker, Malcolm, well, we're going to see what's going to happen. All right, so let me introduce you our next speaker. All right, Malcolm Ong, CEO of The Fish Farmer. Uh, is, a, is a good friend of mine as well. I, we have worked together in many things. And one of the key things that uh, Malcolm will have to answer is that, is the statistics real, Malcolm? You know, let's think about it. 60 over percent say they're buying local. Is that what you're feeling? Are you having high demand? Uh, you know, while your fish is running out, we are not sure. I'm going to ask him for more details later as well. So Malcolm, after graduating from NUS, Malcolm started his career as an IT engineering. You know, that's the, where the story starts. He's an IT and subsequently posted uh, to work in Seattle, uh, Washington, USA for two years. He won a scholarship to study in England and graduated with MBA from the University of Bradford. Malcolm then joined a startup in 1996 and grew the company to a 20 million in revenue in 20. Oh seven. After being in IT for nearly two in, uh, for two decades, Malcolm sold off his IT company uh, to a French big, uh, a big French group and embarked on a career switch. And what a switch he did! Malcolm now is a farm premier, uh, one of the Singapore largest marine fish producing mullet, milkfish, red snapper, sea perch, you name them. And more than seventy percent of his farm are made of recycled materials and power to harness the renewable solar energy. And Malcolm believes that farming is the best option to provide fish sustainability to meet the world growing demand as well. So if you are someone that wants to be a farmer because you feel that, yes, Kenny, I want to be a farmer, but I'm not sure whether should I be one. Well, here we are. All right, Malcolm, over to you. Good afternoon to everybody. My name is Malcolm Ong. I assume that you can see my slide. It's OK. And can yes, hear welcome. Me? Good, good, good. Very good. Good? Yep. All right. I only like 61% of the people here. The other 39%, I, you know, you have to work harder to be my friend. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> people ask me, why did I get into fish farming? Why did I come, you know, from IT come into fish farming? I got a very funny story. My, my uh, staff, uh, he came from China. He said, Malcolm, you're very funny. I come from China and I escaped China to come to Singapore to study and go into IT. And then you go from IT, go into farming. You're very strange. Yeah, so people ask me why I got into farming. And there's a saying, give a man a fish and he will eat for a day. Teach him how to fish. Teach him how to fish and he can avoid the wife for the whole weekend. And so that's why I got into fish farming. Jokes aside, uh, the fish farmer was established to provide fresh, safe and affordable fish to the local Singapore market. We have a slogan, love seafood, love the sea. What does that mean? If you keep cutting down trees, you won't have any forest left, right? Uh, you have to replant the trees in order to uh, have uh, to have your forest. Similarly, if you keep catching fish from the sea, you won't have any fish left. So what is uh, fish farming about? Fish farming is so that we can provide an alternative instead of catching fish. All right. So while we love seafood, we must love the sea. I'm going to start uh, my presentation with the squid game. This is the latest big hit. All right. So I'm going to ask you a question. If you don't know the answer, you will be eliminated. All right, the squid game. So the question is, if this is a squid, if this is a squid, what is this? If this is a squid, what is this? The answer will be told to you at the end of the presentation. All right, so stay tuned. 
I have a short video to show you, uh, to give you a short tour of my farm. So I'll ask YC to play the video now. I'm going to, hold on YC, let me, how do I, uh, sorry YC. Yeah. Over to you. I see. Sorry, there's some tech. We are getting the video up. Just give us one moment. Maybe Malcolm can tell everybody where do you get the squid inspiration from? <laughs> I like the squid. <laughs> <laughs> it's called a dad joke. My my daughter. I like to give my daughter these kind of jokes, and she'll roll her eyes and she'll groan at me. Yeah. <laughs> For those for those who have not known Malcolm itself, you'll be really surprised. You know, sometimes when he crack jokes itself, you you are like stunned. Now, huh? are you a farmer? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, because uh, you know, I, I I I when I go to my I bring my daughter to school, and uh, because we all don't like Chinese, and uh, so I tell the other parents, don't worry, don't worry, because uh, you know my daughter also doesn't like Chinese. So I said, don't worry. Uh, it's okay to fail, you know. Uh, and the parents say, Malcolm, how can you say that? Don't tell my daughter this. I say, it's okay. <laughs> if you fail the Chinese like me, you fail, then you become a fish farmer and then you're forced to learn Chinese because everybody in the industry all speak Chinese. So you have to prove anyway. So, all right. <laughs> so, so for those who know here, you can see that this is what I'm trying to do here, right? That you see farmers themselves are full of stories and something for you to learn. Now, let's go back to the video. It's ready now. Let's watch the video and see his life as a farmer. Thank you. Okay. Um, you can still hear me, right? We're good? Yes, yes, yes. All good, Malcolm. Good, okay. Let's see my video, uh, my screen. Yes. Great. Okay, so that was an overview of our farm. Uh, we have four farms all together uh, in Lim Chu Kang and Changi, spread over a few areas. Uh, some photos of our Lim Chu Kang farm and our Changi farm. A beautiful view, beautiful view of our uh, farm. Uh, each farm is about two football fields in size. We farm the largest range of species in Singapore, and I'm proud to say, as a local farmer, we have one of the uh, we are one with uh, one of the most number of uh, customers. So this story is about story of my journey into fish farming. All right. So it started in the beginning, you know, as a young engineer and I had to put on my tie and all that and go to work. And after a few years, I decided, hey, uh, let's try to do something different. And uh, I got to know some fish farmers and like what Kenny says, the fish farmers, uh, they shared their life with me because uh, nobody else wants to, to get interested in farming. Their kids, they didn't want, the young people don't want. And although I, I'm old, but I'm one of the youngest in, uh, in the industry when I came in. So we grow milk, milk fish. And my, uh, a lot of people ask me, hey, why you grow milk fish? You know, what made you choose milk fish? So I told them that I didn't choose the fish. I chose the partner, right? Because I have no experience. So I had to uh, partner together with some people who have experience. Uh, this is an early photo of us uh, relaxing in the farm. And uh, uh, these are my partners. And so some people ask me, how did I change career from engineering to farming? And I tell them, no, 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 you stay in engineering. Farming, I got a lot of competitors already. But they insist, they say, Malcolm, share with me how you change from engineering to farming. So I try to discourage them. I tell them, what I do, you cannot do. Right? And they were stunned and they say, uh, uh, share with me. So I said, when I first went into talking with partners, talking with people, right, uh, they have to be comfortable with me and I have to be comfortable with them. So my partners wanted a sign 
they wanted a sign that Malcolm is the right partner. And so what they did was they look at my car license plate and they buy the 4D, the, the number of my car license plate, and they went to buy 4D, the lottery. And they strike. And they decided this is a sign. And therefore, we should partner together. And that's how I got in. And so I tell my friends, you can't do what I do. So finding partners is all about trust. That's very important. Trust is key. And also, when you market your produce, trust is key. Because the first thing they see is not your fish. The first thing they see is you. And they need to trust you. All right? Now, after finding my partner, then I, we started looking at finding customers. And uh, of course, we have ambition. We want to sell fish to the largest retailer in Singapore, NTUC Fair Price. Previously, all the farms, farmers sold to the wholesalers. Uh, so five farmers, uh, we banded together and we requested for a meeting with Fair Price. The manager came in and he listened to us and he says, well, uh, if you uh, can meet our requirements, yeah, I'll consider. And so he uh, turned to the seafood buyer and then he left and the seafood buyer took over and he explained to us how difficult it is. Uh, this form to fill, this thing to pay, this thing you must do. This. It was really, really, really discouraging. Really discouraging. And we left and uh, it was tough. You know, how to get into fair price like that. And so, um, well, I tried to put together this thing I don't know, this thing I don't know, this thing I know. And then I, uh, one week later, I called the buyer, seafood buyer. I say, uh, can I come and see you? Because, um, you know, uh, I, I'd like to talk about how we can supply fish to you. I don't have all the answers, but I'd like to talk with you. And the seafood buyer said, Malcolm, sure, come. And when I went there, he was talking to a lady. This lady was trying to sell prawns, right? And this seafood buyer was telling this lady nearly word for word how difficult it was. Nearly word for word. And as I listened to it, I realized what he was doing. He was trying to see which of us would come back, which of us would want this business enough to fight, to come back. And so uh, this poor lady left and I don't think she ever sold prawns and uh, the other four didn't make it either. So I was the only one left. Uh, I'm proud to say. And so we followed up. There were many, many, many difficulties. We just started with 20 kilos a day. That's awful. But now we sell about three tons of fish a day uh, to NTUC Fair Price and to various restaurants. Important, when the opportunity is there, you must be ready to grab the opportunity. When a fish swim by, you must be ready because you will never know when to swim by again. Finding customers is critical. Many people start looking at farming, how to do everything else, and forget that what they do, they must do for customers. All right? So it's critical. After finding partners, finding customers, I also start to find uh, myself, you know, and understand a bit. You know, if you look forward, very hard to understand, right? But you look backward, and you say, oh, yes, you know, this, 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 I do help me. Uh, so each of us are given a set of cards. Singapore is given a set of cards. We are small and so on. Dr. D has explained, right? And uh, some of us got twos and threes. Some of us got kings and queens. We have to play the best game with the cards given. And so that's what happened to me. Uh, I didn't have farming experience and so on and so forth. But uh, in my engineering time, I was with Singapore Technologies. And... Uh, uh, it was a complicated organization. You can't do anything. Uh, you have to do a lot of uh, paper. You've got to write and justify. And then you've got to write to the finance department. And you've got to write to the legal department. And you've got to write to all these departments. And uh, nothing moved. And some people are very frustrated and angry, you know, in working in such an environment. Well, I took my piece of paper and uh, you know, I went to the finance department and say, hey, look, I need to get this done. You know, how can we do? You know, so sit down, talk, talk, talk. I learned about finance. 
went to the legal department, sit down, talk, talk, talk. I learned about legal. And these things, people don't think about it, right? They think about opening a farm, right? They forgot there's a legal part to it, you know? They forgot there's a registration. They forgot there's finance. They forgot a lot of things. But these things stood me in good stand uh, to help me uh, in my uh, walk uh, in becoming a fish farmer. So uh, I discovered myself uh, as I did fish farming. And of course, like I said, looking back, I realized that what I did was helpful for me when we started this business. So in summary, all right, in summary, uh, I had to find the partners, I had to find the customers, and of course I found, a, uh, I started to find myself also, and we created this new business. Is there a future in fish, right? That's all uh, what we are thinking about. Is there a future in fish? The answer is 100% yes. If not, I wouldn't be here, right? Uh, we, I would have given up a long time ago. Not only is the future in fish, all right, uh, it's actually a very bright future in fish, right? Uh, first of all, right, uh, fish farming will help you save the family. There's this article about this Indonesian woman who was so angry with her husband because the husband didn't clean the fish tank. She, she couldn't cook his arowana. <laughs> so if only the husband had known Malcolm Ong, right, then he buy my fish, he would have saved himself and saved his wife uh, and his uh, family. But on a serious note, this article came out when I started looking at fish farming. All right. Fish head curry, a rare dish in 10 years. And this article is true. You know, our fish head curry uh, is made from this fish called Angkoli, uh, quite, well, like a white snapper, Angkoli, right? But nowadays, the fish head is not made out of, uh, it doesn't come from Angkoli, it comes from Angkwe, uh, red snapper. Angkoli is wild caught, you know, so it dwindling, dwindling. So now they start to change. So it's true, it's happening. And there is definitely a future because we need to do it. If we don't, then we're going to just, you know, have no more fish left for the next generation. All right. So is there a future in fish? Yes. Fish farming will help save our seas. SOS. Fish farming will help to save our seas. And that's our calling. All right. We have to do something about it. Some photos of my journey into fish farming. You know, we had uh, some exhibitions and newspaper reports and, uh, you know, uh, some of the fun things that we do. I promised you that I will give you the answer at the end of the presentation. So the question was, if this is a squid, if this is a squid, what is this? So I'm sorry for the foreigners. This is a sotong ball, all right? So if you're a foreigner, you go and, go and check with your friends. So this is a sotong ball. So I would like to wish everybody good health by eating good fish. Thank you very much. <laughs> well done, Malcolm. <laughs> I really love your, your squid, squid concept as well. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of us here really enjoy uh, the sharing by the farmer itself. I think this is real. I mean, uh, nobody has ever shared that farming is easy. It, it's never. All right. And at the end of the day, you know, uh, one of the key things that uh, strike me very hard is that if you want to be a farmer, you know, from what I heard from Malcolm itself is that please make sure that your partners buy 4D. If they strike me, they're a good partner. <laughs> well, well, well. Uh, jokes aside, jokes aside. But I think... No, but this he... is a serious... It, it, it's a true story. Uh. I, I wasn't yeah, yeah. making it up. It's a true no, story. No, 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 no. That's how to we came Totally, together. totally. And I, I, and I think that the more important thing itself is uh, from the 4D story that you shared, it's really about trust. Uh, I, I can't stress how important this is. You know, I, I have a recent encounter with many young, uh, you know, people who are really passionate about supporting local farms. And sometimes they get very frustrated because they felt that the farms uh, are not as forward looking. They, they look at things a bit differently. But I was really the fortunate one that has gone through 15 of my life, of years of my life, uh, working with the farmers and learning from them understanding that you know fish is different from eggs is different from vegetables is different from cow different from goats farm 
Uh, and the fact that, you know, the trust that was built doesn't come easy as well. Yeah. To, to be able to earn the trust of the farmers today where I can start the local farm, working with the farmers to come out with different experiences, to come out with the pack, etc. All I can share with those who are really eager to understand farmers itself, you have to start now. Right? You have to understand that farmers itself are very different. Uh, and we look at things very differently, but we are no different from Bill Gates. We, we just want to make profits. You know? So we, we have to understand that demand and supply is just as critical. So the second part that Malcolm hits really uh, deep into mind sharing itself is literally demand. Finding clients, he says, is very important. You know, we can have all the fabulous tech. Are they wrong? They are not wrong. All right. The researchers and the technologies are helping the farmers to be better and more efficient. There's nothing wrong about that. All right. If uh, technology and research can help the farmers to increase their profit by 30, 50 percent, why not? That should be the way. But unfortunately, a lot of us don't look at the demand side, especially in Singapore. 90 percent of our food is imported, guys. 90 percent. All right. And if we really want to support local, I think finding local produce itself could be a challenge at times because you have to see where they are being sold and where can you buy from them. So it will take a really a whole ecosystem to get all these things in place. And it's not going to be that straightforward as well. You know, and when he was sharing about, you know, like first it was about crap that Dr. Lee have shared. And then now Malcolm talked about sotong balls because of his squid game. <laughs> and I think it, it's really real. All right, that no farmers, no food. That's the mantra and the purpose, you know, that I really believe in. And, you know, what, and my enjoyment I have to share with everybody here is that when you work with farmers, you really understand that farmers are really simple people. It's a, they're just producing food for us to eat. You know, we should not complicate food in general. All right, just that there is a lot of ecosystem that's in place. But I think I hope you all enjoy the sharing by Malcolm. I thought this is so important in this curation because you need to understand from all sorts of different equal partners that's coming into this ecosystem. And I think Malcolm's sharing was great. I, I always enjoy his sharing all the time. All right, and I hope you have enjoyed yourself just as much as me. Okay, so now we're going to take a slight break. Thank you, Malcolm. All right, we're going to move on from here. All right, we're going to have a, a Slido break. Uh, YC is going to put up the next uh, Slido. If you go on to the next one, before I bring up my last speaker, uh, the poll is up. All right, so as we were talking about, you know, from your crack to your sotong ball right now, do you think technology will make prices uh, be more expensive, cheaper? Or do you think it's not going to be the same? It's going to be the same. Let's, let's put in your Slido thoughts, right? So everyone, you can, for those who are new, who just joined us halfway through, uh, just go to slido.com and key in TLFX 2021 or QR code the screen itself. Uh, you will literally be in straight away and uh, hope to have your participation as well. So that you get yourself, you know, yeah, I think you have learned quite a fair bit of things from Malcolm and Dr. Lee. And our next speaker is going to give you a more intensive uh, sharing where you can really understand the potential of fish in the future as well. So let, let's get this going, all right? Uh, wow, uh, it's like stock market that I'm looking at right now. It's better than stock market, you know? And uh, prices will be more expensive, standing at currently 39%. Uh, people say that it's cheap, uh, will hit down to 33%. Uh, and now it's going out to 30, remain the same, it's now at second. All right, keep, keep the numbers coming. All right, let, let's have more people participate so that we have a good feel. How do you think? All right, what's the myth and what's the truth? All right, I think this is what we are here for. Because no point guessing, no point saying this and that, but ultimately itself is that what you think and then eventually hear from the horse's mouth. All right, the experts are all here today, all right, to tell you what are the challenges that they face. I mean, of course, we all know that there is no easy way out, right? Whatever that we do, there's always two parts of the, the coin as well. So these are all just important uh, ground up sentiments that we feel and that's important for us to actually move on from there as well. All right, so looking at the poll itself, 43% uh, of you thinks that fish will be more expensive. Wow, will that be the case? And and there will be an uh, equal number of 30% that says that fish will be cheaper and 30% says that the fish will remain the same. So what's the answer? Well, let's, let, let me invite the next speaker. All right, which I think some of you may have known him as well. He's no other than Dr. Fashai. All right, Dr. Fashai is the president and CEO, founder of the Blue Aqua International Group. 
All right, Dr. Fashad uh, received his PhD on terrestrial and aquatic ecology, stream uh, pond ecology, and, and alumnus of the Kellogg School of Management. He's also a uh, board director of Aquaculture Engineering Society and past president of the World Agricul uh, Aquaculture Society. He's also the inventor of the highly commented mixotropic system, a super intensive stream farming system with PCT patent in over 144 countries and applied by over 4,000 customers. Dr. Fasha has been actively working as a consultant to the Indonesian Fisheries Department, working group for standard aquaculture practices and management in Singapore, and a adjunct professor to the University of Malaysia, Sabah, UNS. So you have your crab, you have your sotong, the squid, and now we're going to learn about prawns. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Fasha. Yeah, hi, good afternoon. Thank you, Kenny. Thanks a lot for the very long introduction, actually. <laughs> so let me, I pull up my presentation and, uh, uh, okay. Uh, you can see my, my slides, right? Yes, the slides are good. Very good. Okay, thanks a lot. I mean, um, I, I share a lot of, I think, point uh, with Dr. Lee and Malcolm, definitely. And I would like to say that Singapore is definitely is a much more different place to do farming and working on the, this industry. It's totally different. I mean, like, it's not so many market. You really need to look for the buyer for your product, but Singapore is very, very important. You need to have all those things. And um, okay, let's let's see. Uh, we're gonna discuss. We don't have much time. Also, I mean, I'll just give you a very brief um, about the Blue Aqua. We work on a you know food security, and you know my company. We have a presence in over 14 country, and I have two different patent. Uh, we work with mainly a lot of uh, shrimp farmer around the world, and. <laughs> We have a you know very different and unique ecosystem of working in in our business. So we work on urban farming. We work on traceability. You know we do like A to Z, like from feed to the you know supply of the fish, and also we, we do have a lot of things on the research and development. Okay, just go back to what we were discussing. I mean the question was really really fish price increase or reduce and all that. I don't think so. Those are really really too much related to the technology. I, I believe personally technology will help absolutely to to make the fish more affordable. Uh, and the reason is that uh, the technology will help us to be more effective and productive. And the one that's going to increase the fish price is basically increasing the population and the demand. And, you know, these are the things that definitely, you know, it's going to be more challenging. And if you can see a human uh, since, like I have like very simple data since 1964 up to now, the, you know, consumption of the seafood has increased by twice. So that can be one of the key reason for the increasing of the price. And also, if you look at seafood and, you know, aquaculture is definitely one of the lowest carbon emission in the world. So today everybody worrying, worrying about the global warming. And of course we need to eat. So you can see what you can really produce that is more like environmental friendly. Then, um, you know, the, in terms of the land usage, again, aquaculture has a much more smaller land required to produce the same quantity of the protein. And um, okay, so how we can really go there? You know, I, I, I'm a farmer since um, almost 30 years, I think. And uh, I used to do shrimp farming. I have some picture, I can show you some video that those days I work on monodon and the highest stocking density we used to have like was 20 piece, 30 piece. Today in my farm, I can stock shrimp like 2000 piece, 2500. Same goes with the fish and other things also. Uh, I mean, this picture is very interesting and it shows that human do aquaculture since they don't wear clothes. OK, so then uh, you can see that, you know, this industry uh, used to be like a way of people feeding, you know, the family and the village. Then now we have a like traditional farming around the world because I learned farming outside Singapore, even though I'm a Singaporean, but I never learned really farming in Singapore. I worked many years in Thailand, Indonesia, India, Brazil, 
So we see farm is like this, you know, like farm is hot, warm, a lot of mosquito, a lot of, you know, uh, difficulty in terms of, you know, you have to walk from here to there because this is a tradition of farming. And today, this kind of farming is all over the world, more than 90%. So Singapore farms are more like a, like a very luxury hotel compared to what we have in a different part of the world. Then, uh, I don't know, I hope can play. This is, this is when, you know, my farm in Malaysia, I just show you, uh, it was in 1999. I, I don't want to go to the whole things, but this is how we used to do the farming. And I had my, you know, shrimp, you know, monodon farm. And those days, we managed to harvest one of the largest, uh, you know, size shrimp has been, you know, had been harvested during those days. So, and this is how the farm looks like. And this is what we used to work. And, you know, like um, when we do harvesting, you have to go inside the water, catch the fish, catch the shrimp, and then bring it up. And uh, basically, like, I, I had 120 gram monodon and it was like, you know, it goes to the TV in Malaysia. And but those days, uh, even though this is like 20 over years ago, I, I had my lab and we used to do, I mean, the technology those days was not like now, but we had definitely, a, you know, much more ahead of the, what other people do. So we used to have like a nice microbiology lab, water quality lab. And, you know, I used to have a lot of research on, you know, how we can really get the benefit of the, you know, all this technology. And uh, I was maybe the only one that really talking about the bacteria and looking at the, how to manage the phytoplankton. And then those days, the older research of what we had, I, I came up with what we have today, basically. Uh, let me see. Okay, ah, so this is my current farm now, and we do the same monodon, but I have my biomass maybe more than five times of that, and for the wanami, those days no wanami, we do like really like 10 kilo, 12 kilo, and we learn how to really push the problems. We had so many problems and we have to pass through a lot of difficulties, and learning, learning curve, and I think we, we managed to really get the get the system, you know, uh, set for the, you know, Singapore, because in Singapore we have to sell every day. So every farmer basically look at one very important fact, that is the carrying capacity. This is like any farmer, whatever they do, this is the key word. Carrying capacity means why I really can produce how much. And the carrying capacity, it's always limited by the environmental resistance that they are the, the, the key things that lower your productivity. I, I don't have the you know, time to really go through the whole things, but it is very important that everybody understand that these are the very, very important point. Then, uh, you know, when we want to increase the carrying capacity, you need to have, you know, better oxygen, better water quality management. So basically, you have the pond dynamic and inside that you have a water and gas dynamic. And each one of them divided to the, you know, much, much more smaller portion that I, I again, there is no time to discuss. But when you look at the indoor farming today, indoor farming is represent the high technology. We call it smart technology, smart farming technology. Of course, there are a lot of pro and cons, you know, from the skill label to the cost, to the complexity of the whole things, higher capital, land, energy, you know, and many, many other things that, you know, we really have to fix all those things. And then you employ a lot of, uh, you know, technology, but I always say this, Technology does not give you the growth. Technology does not provide you with the productivity. That is a very big mistake. A lot of people think that if you have a nice farm with a lot of monitor, a lot of, you know, probe, a lot of equipment means you can do production. That's a very, very wrong. Production comes from steel in our industry. 40% is the experience and I call it art and 60% is the science of the story. So we can have all this technology, but still it doesn't mean that you can produce because you need to understand a lot of, a lot of small, small details that, you know, require to really, really make you able and somebody like me after 30 years just learned that we know very little. 
so you have different different systems. So what we have done in Singapore, which is very unique compared to the other market, it is that this is the traditional, uh, you know, indoor and RAS system. So we really change it uh, from that system to the a bit different that is low cost and also is more productivity. So generally, when you look at the culture design for the culture tank design, you have circular tank, you have a raceway, you have different, different, which each one of them, they have their own uh, pro and cons, basically. Um, I, these are some of the pictures of my farm in the old days. So we have like a different, different design of the system. But then this is the key things. That is one that I, I patented, basically. So you do indoor farming, you go to Norway, you know, I have a lot of friends there, we work many years there. You talk to them, when you talk about salmon, it's all clear water. So you have you have 100% removing of the bacteria, algae, I don't know, all the gases like ammonia, nitrite, nitrate. So you, you basically purify everything and bring it back to the system. But the system that I have, and it's really, really took us so long, and now I think this is the, my, this few months we managed to really do a very good job and we mastered the whole situation, is that we use the green system. Green system means I don't really remove all those things, because in my opinion, all this, and it is not a bioflop, a lot of people, they learn this word of bioflop. Me and, you know, Taki and I think Yoram have a lot of conversation about this, that, I mean, I personally don't believe too much in bioflop, because that is just the general trend but what we do here is more like a managing the water based on the <clears throat> bacteria and the phytoplankton population and you look at the all the nutrient and you know everything inside basically we look at the you know few things that are very important such as oxygen is is extremely important you can do farming either indoor or outdoor if you have a lack of oxygen and how much oxygen you need it is not something that you can say it is completely depend on your biomass and your farm activity. If you have a very oxidized environment, you need more oxygen. So then, you know, you have a higher density, you have more, you have more biomass, you need more oxygen. You know, out of farm, we provide oxygen and the water current by using a paddle wheel. It's very common tools that many, many farmers, they use around the world. These are from Indonesia and Thailand. Uh, now, for example, we use like a very, very advanced air blower, we use liquid oxygen, we use oxygen cone, because these are extremely important to provide a sufficient oxygen to the water body, because that is the one of, that is the first limiting factor, if you remember the, the graph about the carrying capacity. So that one of the environmental resistance is the oxygen. So if you don't have sufficient oxygen, don't, don't even think about the density and the biomass. Then of course, when you look at the the pond, everybody talk about ammonia, nitrate, but we generally look at this as a nitrogen cycle. Nitrogen cycle, I tell many farmers around the world, you have to learn nitrogen cycle by heart. You have to know. And nitrogen cycle is completely related to the oxygen consumption. So nitrogen cycle composed of, you know, it's it's it consists of, you know, the heterotrophic activity and autotroph activity. So basically ammoniofication is the heterotroph activity and the nitrification is autotroph. But you can have nitrification with the heterotroph bacteria also. So that's why the nitrogen carbon ratio is very, very important. And that nitrogen carbon ratio in the water system, it can be inorganic carbon or carbon. Like in my farm, I add a lot of sugar to my tank because I need to make sure that I have the heterotrophic balance of the carbon nitrogen. But when you talk about the phytoplankton, you are looking at the nitrogen phosphor ratio, which you can basically compare if you have a 10, below 10, you have 20, you have 30, what type of algae and the phytoplankton you have. And this is the very important part of the farming that every farmer that they do indoor, they have to know. To manage this, traditionally people use biological filter and they use like all this bio ball and all those things that basically uh, it is sometimes so difficult to say is this nitrifying bacteria or denitrifying bacteria or just simply heterotrophic bacteria colonize them because it is not again that easy to really really in the system that we run like a green system or we have like a protein schema this is one of the very key things because when you have a high density feed management become very important and on the other hand you have to make sure that you manage 
need because feed is the direct source of the nitrogen. OK, so when the nitrogen come, means when the animal take the feed, either fish or shrimp, then you have uneaten feed and you have a waste and the feces. And these things is the organic matter convert through ammoniification to ammonia and then oxidize to NO2, NO3. It can absorb by phytoplankton, but not NO2, only NO3 and NH4. So all these things is the circle you have. So this is very, very important that you understand these are all. That's what there is no single you know, factor that can make you successful. The whole thing is connected to each other. This is the very old way of feed management. This is the catfish farm. So you can see how they feed. You can have indoor farm. You can do, a, I don't know, very controlled, uh, you know, feed management. But generally, feed management is extremely important. You really, really need to understand how to manage your feed. I always say overfeeding will kill animal, but not underfeeding. So I have technician in many years working, you know, like they really kill my animal by too much feeding. Now I'm running my own farm myself. I don't have it really like a, some technicians so smart they think, but I, I don't think so they can help us. So I'm running myself. I have a very uneducated people, but I can run much better than with the people because there are traditionally certain mindset that is very, very complicated to change. Majoring the water quality is very important. Here you can see you have to do manual. Indoor, we can have a system. You know, this is the OxyGuard system we have. Work very well, I think, is, is one of the, you know, good. But having a too much data, is that good or not? Because data is only good for people that they can analyze data. I have seen a farmer, like outdoor farming, like in Indonesia, in India, in many places, people measure 10 parameters and look at that. They don't know what to do with that. Data must be able to analyze and understand. If your ammonia go up, if your, I don't know, oxygen goes down, if your phytoplankton crash, why? What is the reason? So it's very important. Even like harvesting, normal farm, we do net to harvest. Nowadays, we have a, you know, fish pump, how we can harvest. So these are all the new things and the new technology that come. So what are the bottleneck of the industry? Basically, there is a long list here. You can have from the cost, from you know disease, from market price, everything. But I believe this really depends on the market. Maybe you ask in Singapore. Singapore, there are so many bottlenecks, so many bottlenecks, OK? It's not a really aquaculture and agriculture friendly country, but Anyway, we have to we have to be able to do it. So, but you go to the general aquaculture, you know, country like India again, Indonesia, Brazil, Mexico, I don't know, Vietnam, China. We always see disease is one of the key things. Sometimes between the cost of the feed and the fish meal and all those things now nowadays become, you know, one of the key things. Infrastructure is not important. It's exactly something that in Singapore we pay a lot of attention to that. You know, we want our farm to be so beautiful rather than to be more productive. Okay, infrastructure is something that really, really nobody really care about. It. Then you have like a cost of the fish meal goes up. I remember. 20 years ago, we used to buy fish meal only $250. Now it's $2,500. Soya bean, I don't know, fuel cost. So you can see these are all add to the production cost. You have disease problem. Disease breakthrough is always is a big problem. And many farmers, unfortunately, even they don't know why their fish and shrimp, they die. You know, like sometimes I visit people, I ask, okay, why your fish die? I don't know. And that is the very painful. And, and people spend less money on the managing the disease uh, rather than making their farm maybe more looks nice and beautiful. I have a very nice PCR lab in my farm. For a farm like us, very small, we are not so big compared to the global scale, but I have. It's very important because I sell, for example, my PL. I have a hatchery. I sell my PL to overseas. I sell to Saudi. I sell to many countries, but because we need to make sure that we don't send the sick animal. And also to us, viral disease are very, very important. So it is important that we know what is the you know, effect of the disease. Then you can see, you know, like if you see uh, brooder stock and, uh, you know, the genetic has become very important. We call it SPF, SPR, a specific pathogen free animal or a specific pathogen resistance. And then nutritional requirement, how much we really know that what they need 
you know, every of those species that we are working. Aquaculture is the industry that there are 260 over species we culture. And this is what I keep on telling in Singapore. We cannot do all of them. We have to focus. And when you say focus, people say, oh, I don't know, maybe people, they want to leave it alone. But it's not that. You want, you can culture anything you like, but you have to focus on few species to become a, you know, country that you can say, okay, I'm expert in five, but I grow 500. Okay, so because there are so many things to do, like you look at like brood stock, like, like the nutrition of there, and then, the high quality, you know, uh, system and control for them um, from A to Z, from the larvae up to the harvest. And then we have a lot of difficulty with the internet, you know, international trade that is doesn't apply to Singapore, but many of my customers in other countries like Vietnam, like India, they face that. So like American come and say, oh, you cannot send, I need to, you need to pay tax when you import your catfish to my country. So no anti, no dumping. OK, there is anti-dumping rules and regulation. So these are all is a problem. And of course, the global environment change. There is a climate change and these are all become a huge problem that there is a competition for the land and water. So when we look at the technology that we have, I always call it as a green circulation from green to clean. So my mixotrophic system has been patented in seven country. It many years ago, we can do up to 15 kilogram of shrimp. Even I have much better record of that in a different places. Uh, the whole idea is about environmental modulation. So we look at like, I, I just try to be very simple here, not too much of technical. So we look at the pH and ORP as an indicator. We look at the CN ratio and NP ratio, something that we can change. And of course, bacteria and uh, phytoplankton as our army and soldier in the water. And of course, energy and nutrient are the key things that we want to manipulate and control. So this is how we can manage the, the system. So nutrient balance come from bacteria, the carbon nitrogen, phytoplankton, nitrogen phosphorus. And this is how we can really, really use our army of these two you know, group of the, you know, organism in the water to really help us to increase our carrying capacity. pH is very important, like in the indoor farming, and pH is the result of the photosynthesis and respiration. ORP is extremely important because ORP is the indicator of the carrying capacity. Higher ORP, you have a better environment. Lower ORP, you will not have nitrification and you will have toxicity of the other gases. And then the benefit of the mixotrophic system is very simple. We do have a high stock in density. I don't usually like to call it stock in density. I like to say more like a biomass. You will reduce your energy consumption. You have a zero water exchange. You can reduce the waste and all those things. So outdoor, we have three phases. So we call it like phytoplanktonic phase. So at the beginning, we have a lot of phytoplankton. Then we move to the phytoplanktonic probiotic phase, which is the more like a, in the middle. And then later, at the end of the cycle, we move to the probiotic phase. So these are, I don't go too much detail. Is a 300 over pages patent published. You guys can go and read and find it online. Uh, my company, we provide a lot of farm care product, and these are very important tools for us. And also, we look at like a data management and also AI application. We are working with the SAS, HP, and also, you know, trying to create this software that we can really, really arrange and use it for the farm management. We are at the early stage, but I think. It's definitely very exciting. We're going to have a very good result and it's going to be very, very important for the whole industry. And also we are working on the blockchain. We work with the VeChain company to create the, you know, this, uh, the blockchain uh, for the seafood uh, traceability. It's extremely important. We have done a lot of work with them and hopefully we can launch also this very soon. And this is how it's going to be there. Because traceability today for a lot of consumer is very important. People, they need to know where this food comes from and what is the sources of them. And then, of course, when you look at the innovation, uh, we have some other technology working like a simple tool, like a cartridge that you can put in a water and you can understand what type of virus and bacteria you have. This is a very, very interesting technology. We have done it for a single species or single strain, but not yet for the complete water, you know, column can use. 
And I think that's all. I hope I didn't take too much of time. And um, thank you very wow. much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fashad. I, I'm really wowed by the technology that's involved. You know, uh, I think every farmer itself at the end of the day will never reject um, technology purely because at the same time itself is really about sustainability. Uh, and I think sustainability is really key. Uh, Dr. Fashad, you can stop sharing your screen so that uh, oh, I can help you to take over. Thank you. I'm sorry. No worries, no worries. But I think one of the biggest takeaway I have um, while listening to all the, of course, there's a lot of things that are very scientific, uh, you know, is where it's all about the tech that Dr. Fashad and his team has actually researched over the years. Uh, and to, you know, to grow stream, uh, just a very simple, you know, one stream a day to be what he is today. I'm sure it's not as simple as he tried to put it up earlier. Uh, the kind of agony and pain uh, is something that a lot of us, uh, I would say, under look because uh, it comes at a price. But I think one of the key things that I noticed what Dr. Fashad shared, which I think I would like to repeat, you know, is technology itself doesn't solve everything. And I like it because he himself is in tech and he's talking from a tech company that embraced tech to the T. That is only 60% as what he said, 40% still based on a lot of experience and people. All right, if you don't have the people that are willing to grow food in the farm, there's nothing we can actually do. And that is the hardest part for any farmer to even look at as well. All right, as simple it may be, but it's not so. Good. The second part that really hits me is that this is where I learned today, overfeeding kills, underfeed doesn't. Voila. <laughs> it, it makes me realize that, you know, it's exactly what we have been talking about, right? Food, let's not make it too complicated. Simplicity is key. Sometimes by putting too much of things into the whole ecosystem, itself, instead of solving the problem, we just complex the problem. You know, farmers at the end of the day is that, yes, tech important, yes. Research important, very important. But at the end of the day, the business must be able to sustain. If the business itself couldn't sustain, the rest doesn't really matter. I still remember I was invited to a talk recently, uh, just last year to a Gumi Summit, you know, where I was talking to a lot of chefs there as well. I said the same thing. I say, chef, you may be a one Michelin star, two Michelin star. If my farmers decided not to grow food, there is no Michelin to talk about. It's fact. It's a fact. So I think from this sharing that by Dr. Fashad, I think it makes it very clear that as much as all farmers are eager to bring tech into place, remember this, the ecosystem is just as important. All right, so let, let's us not waste time. We have uh, a lot of questions that has been putting on. Let me invite back uh, Dr. Lee and Malcolm, all right, so that we can have our panel discussion. I know all of you have lots of questions and I can see that uh, the question at Slido is actually happening right here as well. So for those who are in Slido, this is what's going to happen, all right? We are using Slido as our, our platform. Uh, so if you see the question that has been put onto the Slido itself and you like the question, mm. it resonates a lot with you, uh, please feel free to put it up so that we can actually kickstart the whole panel discussion as well. Uh, Malcolm, are you there as well? Let's see whether uh, Malcolm is on board. We, we will just proceed with this first, all right, so that we can get uh, Malcolm on board as well. All right, so uh, to kickstart itself from the Slido, I think I would like to, to share this uh, to Dr. Lee. All right, so Dr. Lee, in the Slido itself, there is actually two questions directed. Uh, one itself is that you mentioned about future meat production facilities will be near cities. They would like to find out your trade secrets. Is there one? Where is it? Can I know more? <laughs> so that's, that's <laughs> one that you would like to share with you. So uh, yeah, what's your answer, Dr. Lee? Uh, yeah. We, we all know that the world actually at this moment produce enough food for the populations. We do. Uh, but why is it we still have a food shortage is because of the logistic issue. So a lot of food wastage from the productions to the consumer. So that distance costs a lot of wastage in the food. So if we can uh, have a better logistic, uh, you know, or better reach from the producers to the consumer, I think that wastage can be mitigated. So one way is up Cause either you move the city to the farm or farm move to the city. That is the reason why uh, to Singapore, this is our advantage. We are so close to the farm. 
And also that's the reason why we choose aquaculture and not terrestrial animals as our uh, protein source. Why? Because if it's terrestrial animals, we are sharing the same airspace. Yeah, there's air pollution. And, and we, we just cannot live next to the chicken farm, am I right? But we don't mind to have fish tank in our home because they're different medium. So because fish using different medium and it's not competing with us for the airspace, as a result, we are more accommodative. And, and that gives us the advantage that why we choose aquaculture as a protein production system for Singapore and not other terrestrial or warm-blooded animals in that sense. So that's one of the, the, the reasons why we can see um, to address the wastage, one way is get closer, but how close can you get? That's the issue because the land cost goes up, labor cost goes up, energy cost goes up, so everything will go up. So there will be a balancing act, yeah. And how close can you be? Yeah. Yeah. I think Dr. Lee, since you are here as well, the, the question that I saw earlier was quite interesting. Uh, why didn't the previous Singapore generation not encourage in a career in farming? You know, like what Malcolm said, our parents say don't be a farmer. It's a you perception. Know? <laughs> What what's the current change? Yes, yes. <laughs> what what no, do you it's, feel it's a about this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's purely perception. If you ask your, your our mom and dad, you know, to them farming, you know, wow, my goodness, a very tough one. Under the hot sun, a lot of mosquitoes, you know, low pay, you know. Why are you doing that? Especially you got a degree from university, and why you want to be a farmer? So so that is the the old generation perception of farming. It's old traditional way of doing things. But now we are different. You look at what Fasha is doing; it's very different. It's all high tech. Right, you go to his farm, you know, it's hot, yes, <laughs> because his, his tent is actually oven, but it's high tech, okay? So you, you, it's different skill set we're talking about. But the, the older generations, that controlling the career of their kids is not understood. That's why we are trying to reach out to this group of the uh, people as well, that, you know, because if we want to have more youngsters coming to this industry, you know, and, and their parents must support the endeavor. If the parents keep on blocking them, then it's very difficult. You might getting it. So that's why it's not just like, you know, training the kids, uh, make them understand, but also educate the parents that farming now, especially in agriculture, even in agriculture, is very different. It's completely different from their times. Yeah. I think I totally can resonate with uh, Dr. Lee as well. I mean, as a fourth generation farmer, I'm also a graduate as well. All right. But at the end of the day, our parents' job is to say, you know what? I have given you the degree, get out of the farm, you know, work for somebody. That, that's what happens to all the family run uh, industry that you know you can see that as well and and but the thing itself is that you know when you dabble yourself deep into it uh, and really get yourself you know two feet into the ground and understand what the potential is and the farmer's plight um, you see a vast opportunity as well but it's not easy i'm not saying that there is opportunity equals to easy you just have to get yourself really into the system and understand what's going through as well. All right, so let's let's go on to more questions. I think one of the uh, questions that was uh, having a very huge light itself uh, is how is SFA supporting and helping farmers all right, in agriculture and aquaculture when they're importing produce from overseas, which are usually cheaper? Wow, I think this is a $1 million question. I think uh, some of the speakers here have benefited from the support. Maybe we can get the sharing. Maybe we can start off, Malcolm. Any any parts to this? You're on mute, Malcolm. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, SFA, uh, first of all, uh, Singapore is a uh, open country, right? Uh, so one of the strategies is to source food from everywhere so it's not possible to just uh, close up yeah so that's that's a uh, given that's one of the cuts that are given to us we we have to live with that um but uh, sfa uh particularly wants to look at productivity look at improvement so they give uh, some help uh for technology if we, uh, we want to inquire te acquire technology um and also uh, they've also been helping in terms of um, promoting, you know, uh, promoting, you see this blue, uh, red, red tag, uh, a love local tag, uh, you know, uh, to, to, so that people can identify that this is a local produce. So SFA is taking some steps. Uh, as usual, I think uh, for every step that SFA takes, I think the farmer needs to take three steps. You can't just uh, depend on uh, SFA. Uh, farmer has to take three steps, and then uh, you know uh, other people can help you and 
and, and push you along or guide you along, but you finally have to take the three steps yourself. Yeah, I think it's, um, I mean, frankly, SFA itself, there is a lot of grants. I think we we, uh, we don't have any representation here, but if you are really keen, uh, there's definitely a lot of grants. But I think one thing that Melkin have shared itself is that government's grant is only one part of the equation. Yep. All right. Uh, and that shouldn't be your capex. If everybody based on the government's grant as a capex to, to do their business, I think they will be a very tough thing forward as well. Yeah. Dr. Fasha, do you have any sharing about um, you know, uh, our agency supporting you in your big dream? I mean, uh, I would say we don't expect even SFA to come and stop importation and all those. I think those are not a, not the right type of support. But what I would like to see from SFA as a government agency in charge of the food security is that I think number one is that they have to understand, they, they must have a better understanding about the about the industry in, in general. It's not like only Singapore. I mean, like this industry is connected to many, many other places. And looking at it as a standard uh, to create a really, really the correct platform is very important. You know, like sometimes because many of our colleagues in SFA, they may see the industry only in Singapore. And that is that is how we face a problem. And, and they should be the coordinator with the other agency in Singapore to make the others to understand this industry better. It should not be like SCDF to come and say, you have to put a sprinkler in your fish farm. Or I don't know, NEA come and say, why you have a mosquito in your farm that there is a lot of water. You know what I say? These are these are serious and real problem, but I think that is one type, one part that SFA should do. And another thing that I think they should look more as a, um, I w- I've always used the word of the teacher, I think SFA should be more like a teacher and come to teach the farmer on the what are the right things to do and not on uh, maybe sometimes too much of the you know creating maybe some some bottleneck because sometimes you know when you go and tell the farmer you have to produce you know 500 ton in one hectare assume that's going to be a lot of pressure to the farmer. That's what the farmer, they have to go and get. So it's it's a, like a, it's a both party. Lah. But I absolutely agree with Malcolm also that it, there should not be a business run based on the support. In any other country, we don't have any agency like SFA can help. So sometimes I think our demand also too much, but they are doing uh, what they can do. But uh, it's, a, it's a both party of understanding. Lah. I mean, like it's, it's more like a getting the correct i would say business plan in place that is yeah. what i was yeah thank you dr fasha i think i think it's really clear right i mean there is uh, always the whole ecosystem as you can hear from all the speakers earlier itself there is no one side of the business that can be work in silo all right everything comes into play so i am sure we are still not forgetting something which i have shared this uh, many times when I, I was giving talks in the past that Singapore is only 54 years old. We are a young nation. As a young nation itself, you know, we used to be agriculture state in the 60s. We export food. Today, 54 years later, only less than 1% of the land is left. All right, we became a first world country. So something has to sacrifice. But now looking back itself, maybe as we are talking today, agriculture is coming back to the city. We are coming back in a vengeance. We are taking back more space. We are taking back more concepts. You never know. And we, as what Dr. Lee have shared, this will become the, the the kind of concepts and prototype that we can use and become our our forte that our expertise that we can export this overseas as well. You never know. All right, let's let's go to the next question. Okay, this is going definitely to be Malcolm. All right, Malcolm. I think everybody is very eager. They love what you have shared. Uh, and, and you know how much of your fish actually or percentage of fish actually is in the wet market because I think everybody go to hawker centers, wet market. I think this is really very ground. Uh, you know, what percentage of fish farmers produce goes to them or majority goes to supermarket? Okay. Um, well, I would say that uh, uh, because we don't sell directly to the wet market stores, we sell to wholesalers who sell to wet markets. So these wholesalers could sell to various parties. So I don't really know, but as a complete whole, around about uh, 75% of my produce goes to the supermarket, online market, 
wet market retailers. So 75%. And the 25% goes to the hotels, restaurants, uh, these uh, food services company, you know. Uh, so actually a large part of my business uh, is to direct custo or to customers uh, who frequent this wet market is being wet market is one of them. Yeah, so we sell to the wholesalers who take care of the wet market. And then of course, we sell also to retailers, online uh, shops, etc. Yep. Okay. So there you go. So as I said, uh, Malcolm is just one of the farmer in Singapore itself. Uh, but you can see that, you know, Singapore, like it or not, remember the statistics I showed earlier when I begin my presentation that, you know, fish itself is only 10% of the total demand. All right. And as much as what the, all the farmers here, whether they are tech or, or, or sea based farmers, they are doing their best to try to ramp it up to 30%. So there is still a long way for the farmers to do, but most importantly is no farmers, no food. You need to ensure that demand side is also taken into consideration. Uh, Malcolm, since you're on board, I uh, just noticed there's two more questions uh, targeted for you. One itself is that how do inspired farmers like yourself, everybody was really inspired by you, all right? Uh, where can we get the capital, the land? Doesn't look easy to apply for space and licensing to be a fish farmer. See, now you make everybody want to be a fish farmer and buy 4D, huh? <laughs> Yeah. Well, uh, the first thing is, if you tell dad jokes, you're not going to get a lot of followers. Uh, can't inspire many people if you keep telling dad jokes, okay? So, um, yeah, uh, uh, I think one of the reasons, one of the things that I say is that uh, why we need to support local is this. Actually, by supporting local, you support the next generation, right? Because if you can support local, then, you know, then this industry can flourish and your children and your children's children may come into this area. Uh, Dr. Fassad, Dr. Lee, they are making things very interesting uh, by applying all these new uh, concepts and new technology. So I think uh, uh, things are changing. When I first came in, uh, very few people wanted to come into farming. And uh, in this last 10 years, uh, so many new young, uh, bright entrepreneurs have come in, uh, especially in the vegetable farming side, we see uh, a, a lot of a lot of them. Uh, then what was the other question again, how do we get the capital, the space to be a farmer, right? Right? Million yeah. dollar question, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so it depends on what you want to do. If you want to build a very big facility, uh, all that, then yes, you have to get uh, right to a strong paper and then apply for capital but um, uh, what I did was to find partners and I think uh, I would advise that uh, if you haven't gone into farming do uh, take baby steps because it's a really deep pool you don't know huh? you you put in a dollar uh, the dollar will, will, will disappear very fast and you put in another dollar the dollar will disappear very fast again so it's a very very deep pool I would advise you to go in uh, gingerly with uh, preferably with partners, uh, people who have the expertise uh, and then take step by step. And then after that, you can uh, decide. Um, one good thing I must tell you, good news. A lot of venture capitalists, a lot of people with money looking for young people, looking for ideas, looking for technology. So that's the good news for you. You've got good ideas. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of people with money. Yeah, I think I think it's it's not wrong that in today's world where we can never imagine that you know uh, grab is changing. Yeah. At the same time itself, you know, uh, cryptocurrency is also changing the way things are being done. Uh, I think there's quite a fair bit of things that we all notice as well. But I have one question that I wanted to ask Dr. Fashad. You know, um, you yes. know, as, as myself as an entrepreneur. You know, I have noticed uh, quite a lot of uh, changes over the years. And as a fourth generation farmer, uh, business was never easy. And, you know, we are always inspired by different groups of people uh, to learn from their experiences. So I have one, you know, I hear you, I can feel your pain. I can feel the kind of things you have gone through in the 30 years, because I know that it's not easy to produce that stream that you show us. It's as simple as that stream. But the kind of pain that you have gone through from Indonesia to Malaysia to Singapore itself was never easy. 
if there is one failure that you have experienced before that you hope that you can change, what would that one failure be? Oh, that's a, that's a lot of failure we have, you know, like I think uh, I remember many years ago, I mean, like if you want like an actual scenario is that like uh, many years ago, I had a farm in Sarawak. I never forgot like in year, I think 2001. I had an 80 hectare farm in Sarawak and I start to develop bigger and bigger and bigger and we keep on doing the production without really keeping too much backup money. So I learned one thing. Then the SARS disease came and the shrimp price dropped to lower than my cost. So basically I lost everything. <laughs> so yeah. what I would suggest to everybody that when you are running a business, you always make sure because aquaculture and generally livestock, because you see my business is not only farming, we supply a lot of things to the farmer also. So I deal with a lot of farmers. I always tell them that the, the farming require you must be ready to lose three cycle. Whatever you do, doesn't matter, fish, shrimp, you must have a backup of the cash for three cycle and you don't try to do the cheap farming. That is, you're going to lose even more. So the farming required, you must have cash and backup in your pocket. For three cycles, you agree to lose either disease, weather, your worker, thief, you know, like there are many, many things can happen. If you can keep this three cycle money in your pocket, you'll be successful. Because out of three, if you get even one cycle successful, I think the profit can cover the last two cycles. But the problem is that many farmers, they don't have that. And then they try to borrow money. They try to use cheap farming. Cheap farming means they cut from this, they cut from that, but they don't understand. Like when you buy PL, you buy finger link, people look for a cheap product. That is the that is the most, you know, biggest mistake that somebody can do. Because finally this fish and shrimp baby wanna, they're gonna grow and become a real product that you sell. So if that quality not good, you are wasting your money. You buy a cheap fit, you're going to waste your money. But if you don't have a beautiful farm, it's okay. If you don't have like a, you know, love, but that is what I can say, single advice. Always have sufficient uh, cash flow and backup. Otherwise, this business can burn you like anything. Totally spot on. All right. I think what <laughs> Dr. Fashad have just shared is a multi-million uh, response that every one of us must also learn as a upcoming farmer or existing farmer as well because it's never easy uh, in every business that we do you know many of times you always hear about the good side of things that wow we're going to have technology we're going to have this all and that by the end of the day itself you know we need to have a great balance as well all right um well, that was great sharing dr fasha thank you so much for that and i think i'm going to go through the last two questions as we are running out of time um, all right, let's do, I think we have quite a number of uh, students here, so I can uh, maybe try to answer them as well. Okay, uh, this is to every one of the speakers here. Um, as more young farmers are uh, entering the industry, what are some ways to increase digital adoption in farms? Uh, example, gaining trust, transparency, target diseases, that's one. And I also saw another question that I thought this is what the young uh, you know, a lot of uh, Gen Z are asking me the same question, you know, in basically balancing production and climate change. You know, on one hand, we need to make money. Then on the other hand, we need to go eco. You know, how does this two go? So basically two things, right? Number one, how do we entice young farmers to come in that they can actually help us in our business? Number two, choosing between eco and sustainability in terms of profits. What are the challenges that we face? Yeah, anyone would like to start? Maybe I can I can comment something about the these two question. Very short one. Then they, my colleagues they can continue. Okay, you see, yeah, uh, when you talk about young generation come, I think I have I have seen a lot of uh, like an intern and the young people come to at least to my farm to work with us here or Indonesia or other place. The problem is the expectation. That's what I say. Like when the farm, when the, these people come to the farm, they think that farm must be very, very comfortable. They should not have any problem. No mosquito, no hot sun, no sweating, no dirty, nothing. It's just a coming to office and going back. 
And that's definitely, definitely not work. Even I believe that the Singapore farms are more, more comfortable than any other place in the world. Still, there are problems. So that, that's that's the mindset, you know, like we try. I, I have done a lot of training in my life. So sometimes you deal, you know, with the people that they work and they understand this industry is a tough industry. You are dealing with a dirty things. In, I mean, to me, it's not dirty, but to them it's dirty, you know. So that's one thing that is very, very important that I think the young generation, they must understand this is nothing to compare to the office work or wearing a nice tie and suit, you know. If I see my technician comb his hair, huh? nicely come, definitely he's a lazy one. Because good technician, <laughs> good technician cannot comb his hair, you know. It cannot be, it means he never jump in the water, you know. <laughs> so that is, that is means, you know, this industry we need, this is a hand on how, how much technology come in. That is what I see a question. Somebody asking me how we are working on the SAS and all those things and AI. My, my final goal project, I hope before I pass away, you know, I can finish that is that I want to use the AI to run the farm, to run the IOT, but that's going to take years because you need to teach. You need to have the machine learning. You have to teach the AI if the ammonia goes up or the oxygen low or this one happened, how to tackle that. And that one has 200 reasons those things change. And teaching that 200 reasons to the AI, and AI exactly detect what is the reason today and is not the one that yesterday happened, it takes a lot of time. So basically melting between the technology and the science with real farming is a long process it's not going to be that easy yeah i'm sure thanks for sharing all about malcolm or dr lee any comments on this i'll let dr lee go first <laughs> dr lee the smarter Over one must go first <laughs> <laughs> malcolm you sabo me right <laughs> uh no, no, on, honestly the uh digitalizations is eventuality right we are looking into the industry 4.0 for aquaculture now this reason why you look at Fashad going into the uh, uh, the AI because I, I tell tell Doctor Fashad the AI we says is actually trying to clone him. Okay, we are cloning him. Period, because he he got his wisdom and experience, and he can see what other people cannot see, and that kind of wisdom and experience cannot be transferred. Very difficult. That's why we say some got green thumb, right? They are always green because everything they touch grow. Some, oh my goodness, all die. So no matter how you teach them, even to give the PhD, the animals do die on them. So these are something that somebody born with that ability to see things in the details and know this is important. And But to, to them, it's part of the so-called subconscious behavior and they don't realize it. A lot of people don't see that. That's why we say, can we clone Dr. Fasha? This is one of the working model. Right? That's why we, now we are hot his data out, hot into our data lake, okay, and try to get as much information as possible so that we can train the AI and the AI can be as smart as him hopefully one day so that he can retire. You can see now he got no life. Huh? <laughs> Everything happened to his client. No, they call him. Everybody call him. Okay, if you have 2,000 clients in Indonesia, just imagine they just call him once a month. He got no life already. Right? So if he can have an AI to do the first cut, first screen, anything happen, we act flex to the farm owner, okay, do necessary actions. Once elevated to next flex, then he will be activated, okay? So this is why we, we are doing AI, right? So that we can scale, scale to operation. If not, there's no life because the protein production system is a very complex, very, very complicated system it, it, it's and not like plants uh, animals livestock go no time for you to react when they are sick when they're down they die in front of you in two three hours that rapid so your window to respond is very very short unlike plants can take one week to turn yellow okay you have one week to think about what we're going to do with this if they are not right but fish don't doesn't give you this luxury so as a result the pressure is very high and that could be the reason why a lot of farms at extensive farming system in other countries are not making money why they are practicing social distancing in the farm since they cannot manage it they put very less animal okay they put less animal less stress space them out so they don't die right and that is social distancing they're practicing at the farm as a result that translates to poor productivity lower income and that's also the reason why the youngster doesn't want to be a farmer you see it's all work together it's so complicated, all linked together. So now is we are holding a scissors where to cut, right? 
uh, way to cut it, this, this, this spiral loop, uh, uh, that's why the reason why, why Singapore can cut this loop, other countries might not be able to cut the loop, is because we are necessity driven. We have to achieve 30 by 30, we have to address food security for Singapore. So we have to cut, no matter how painful it is, no matter how many toes we've got to step on, we have to cut. And like other countries, they say, okay, uh, let's generation worry about this, we just need to do some food. So that gives yeah. us this advantage. Agree, agree, yeah. agree. Now, thank you, thank you, Dr. Lee. Malcolm, what about you? What's your comments about this? Um, well, uh, uh, first of all, uh, uh, thanks, Dr. Lee, for you know showing us the scope. So much opportunity in uh, farming. You know, if you want to focus only on uh, nutrition, you want to focus on husbandry, you want to focus mm -hmm. on you know, so many, so many things to do. And and I think that's really something exciting for the young people. We think of farming only myopic, right? But this has really opened our 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 eyes and uh, we can, there's so many job opportunities in this area. Um, however, I also would like to also echo what uh, Dr. Fassad says about expectations. Uh, uh, so when you go into a job, any job, Okay, we expect that we want to do A, but not B and C and D and E. And then that makes us not so, not, not very effective. All right, um, I'll tell you uh, 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 some things that happen. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, supermarket, you know, I told you they are my, my customers, right? I have a lot of them. It's not fair price, but one of the supermarket, they came to my farm. Okay, and this is seafood buyer. Seafood buyer, okay. And they're supposed to choose the seafood to da, 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 da. So I harvest the fish, I put it there, I pick up the fish, and the, they scream, ah, scream, you know. I say, hey, come and hold the fish, you know. Come and hold the seafood buyer, young lady, scream, run away. How, how to be a seafood buyer like that, you know? <laughs> Don't dare to touch, do that, do this, do that, do that. Oh my goodness. I'll tell you another one, okay? Uh, MOE, MOE, Ministry of Education, do a, 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 a what to come to my farm, right? So I, 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 uh, they came and you know, say, you know, uh, show the feeding, everything else. Same thing, I take the fish, all that. Oh my goodness, you know how they hold the fish? Like that, like that, you know? Uh, I, I say, hey, hold the fish, so they hold the fish on the tail and hold it like that, you know? Uh, how to do, you know? Uh, so I, I think people like the facade and Maybe I say the old generation, even you, Kenny, you come from a different world, right? Where you are really interested and you want to touch, you want to feel, you want to think. And I hope that, uh, and uh, I really hope that the young generation don't just think of, uh, you know, on the seat on the computer and I want to do farming like that, you know, cannot. One of the things that I kick my, my, my people, I really kick them, you know, because they look at the farming, hey, how is it, the fish, uh, how is it growing, everything else, all that. They forget one thing. They didn't go to the supermarket. At the end, your fish must end up in supermarket and the, it must go there and then people must buy. And if you're not there looking at the supermarket and seeing how the thing, then you're at the farm, you're just myopic, you know? You just look like this, you know? And unfortunately, uh, many times I, I, I see young people Fortunately, very myopic. You want me to do this? Yeah, okay. But then forget that there's a larger picture. Yeah. I just want to say that it's more fun, more fun when you have a larger picture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I think in lieu of time, I think this is all great sharing. Uh, I, I mean, I really learned lots from the three distinguished uh, speakers here today. I think you have enjoyed as much as I do. Uh, and this really come to an end of today's Local Farm Exchange 2021. The future of fish is that one. I think we are very clear today there is one for sure, 110% is what Malcolm puts it. And yeah. that is very promising as well. All right. Better support and I your local farmer. If not, exactly. uh, your wife will take the arowana. And cook <laughs> so you better support me. Yeah? yeah, I think <laughs> I, I would like to really thank uh, the three speakers here, Dr. Lee, Dr. Farshad and uh, Malcolm. I, I think you guys have really created such an exciting web near where there is not only depth, there is so much of things that we can learn. And what is more important today that we have learned is that it takes the whole village to make this work. None of these speakers here, including myself, can make food security into something that everyone can be proud of if all of you don't, including yourself, the participants who have participated. 
if you don't start buying local, if you don't believe in the industry, there is no food on the table. All right, so with that, we also like to say a special thanks to the Aqua Culture Innovation Center, AIC, and the Masik Polytechnic Eco Campus Committee for co-organizing the event with us, without which I don't think today will be a successful one. All right, on behalf of the speakers and all the partners involved, thank you, everyone. You have been great. I have enjoyed myself tremendously with every one of you. Thank you. And before we go, I would like to have everyone to do a little survey, if you can. Uh, let's see, this is our first, you know, and I really hope that you can help us. Uh, QR code uh, and go into this and help us to give your feedback so that we can all learn from you. Uh, tell us what's the next webinar that you would like uh, the local farm exchange to do? Which industry will you be keen? What kind of speakers would you like? It must be as real as it gets. That's right? what every one of the speakers have shared. Keep it simple. All right. This is what one, it's all they about. Want they want squid. They want squid. They want squid <laughs> so I think, you know, it's so interesting from crab. We're all talking about food. You know? Dr. Lee is talking about crab. You know, Dr. Fasha about streams and Malcolm talk about squid. By the end of the day, you'll get us all hungry today itself. But thank you so much. All right. Your feedback is valuable to us. And thank you, speakers. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. All right. We're going to see you real soon. All right. Thank, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.